But it's in the Constitution. But if the Constitution says this, it must be true. It's the law of the land. We continue to talk about the Constitution, many of us who have not read the Constitution. And I thought, well, what an interesting thing to do, to, to say to a constitutional attorney, a professor of the law, uh, who has done a great deal of work with the U.S. Constitution and his work at Arizona State University, how about if we bring Paul Bender in from the College of Law at ASU and say, as we are now, what's it like to explain the Constitution, particularly to students in your classes? It's, it's not easy, but it's also a lot of fun. The main thing you try to explain to people, not only students in class, is to read it and pay attention to the language, and then you will realize that it does not, the language does not answer almost all the questions that you have because it's a constitution and the language is meant to be flexible and a little bit vague because when you write a constitution you don't know what's going to happen in the next hundred years and you're writing language to try to deal with that. So it's principles rather than little rules. There are a couple of exceptions to that in our constitution but not very many. We, we, there are big principles in there and the idea is to try to figure out what those principles mean. What does the principle of equal protection mean? What does the principle of free speech mean? Those are complicated ideas. Uh, and you get, it's fun because you get to talk about really interesting human problems in doing that. And many of those things are still being interpreted. Well, it, but it, it never of, stops being A lot of the folks, and most particularly in Washington, who stand on the Constitution for everything, approach it almost biblically. I was about to say it's a little bit like people saying it's, it, it's in the Bible. You can't do that. Uh, I mean, you can do it, but it doesn't work. It's not the right thing to do, uh, is to say, well, read the Constitution, you'll know the answer. There's almost no question that you read the Constitution and you know the answer, because the Constitution gives you a principle, and you have to apply that principle to what's going on. Uh, and it's rarely obvious how the thing applies. Well, obviously, it couldn't possibly cover everything. It's one of the reasons why part of the system allows for amendments. But as it is right now, are you in awe of what was written well over 200 years ago? No, not awe. That's a little no. bit strong. I think it's turned out to be a very serviceable document. Um, a lot of things are right with it, and a lot of things are wrong with it. The, the thing I'm most in awe of is that our courts have played a role in, in making it work because they have generally, even though sometimes the language doesn't help them too much, they have generally come to solutions of big problems that make a lot of sense. Have and you so examined only, the constitutions of other countries? Some, yeah. Yeah, they, most of them are much more detailed than ours. But the biggest difference, it's changing now, but the biggest difference between our Constitution and most other countries is that in most other countries, it's on paper and it isn't enforced in any coherent way. Whereas in our country, and that's the big strength of our Constitution, from the beginning has been judicially enforced. And no matter what you think of the judges, and even no matter what you think of the provisions in the Constitution, that combination of intelligent, independent people thinking about what it means and applying it to particular situations works well. Review for me, uh, Professor Bender, the process by which an amendment is approved and gets into the Constitution. In the U.S. Constitution, it's hard. Uh, you have to have, you can have a, a constitutional convention. There's never been one, I don't think, uh, except the first one. I don't think there's going to be another one. So the process that's used is it's proposed by something that each House of Congress proposes. And I think you need a two-thirds vote in each House to propose it. And then if you get that vote, it has to be ratified by three-quarters of the states. So that's a process that usually takes a lot of time. And it means that you're not going to get an amendment unless there's a really strong majority in favor of it. A number of people in politics now and in recent years have been talking about having a constitutional convention in order to establish uh, some changes in the, in the budget 
uh, problems that we have in the United States. The problem with that is nobody knows if you can have a con convention that's limited to one or a few specific problems. That's not clear. If you have a convention, it might open everything up. And I think most people who think about this stuff think that would not be a good idea. To You're do. still teaching at ASU, aren't yeah, you? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what. If any of you are thinking about recommending or talking to your children about a career in law, and they're thinking about ASU, uh, listen, this is an example of the kind of leadership that they get at Arizona State University's College of Law. Professor Paul Bender on what's it like? Aren't you glad you stayed with us?